something in your heart between you and somebody else, I encourage you to put it aside just for a little while and allow the songs and the prayers and the scriptures to touch you a little bit to encourage you to be peacemakers, first within yourself and then through all of your relations. So we are gathered here in the presence of Christ, the love of God, to worship and to enjoy our experience as a community of faith. Yeah. <laughs> Walk 
operation in an experiment. It's just something you choose to do. Now, you folks at the back, from God's point of view, how does it make you feel to see these people declaring hatred for one another? Sad and angry. Sad and angry. Let's try something different. Would you folks say, peace be with you? Peace be with you. And would you say, also with you? And also with you. Now, would you say, peace be with you? Peace be with you. And you say, also with you. Also with you. And would you reach across and just hold hands a little bit? Just make contact with one another. <laughs> one, that was easier, wasn't it, Laura? <laughs> and now would you find your seats? <laughs> oh. Now you folks at the back, from the point of view that you occupy, do you prefer what just happened to what happened before it? That's what we're about. We're working to get past hatred. We're working to get to peace. And that's something that really is work. And that's why we sing, worship and work must be one. You can't worship if you don't work. You can't work if you don't worship. Our first reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 11. The royal line of David will be cut off chopped down like a tree, but from the stump will grow a shoot, yes, a new branch from the old root. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight will be obedience to the Lord. He will not judge by appearance, false evidence, or hearsay but will defend the poor and the exploited. He will rule against the wicked who oppress them, for he will be clothed with fairness and with truth. In that day, the wolf and the lamb will lie down together, and the leopard and goats will be at peace. Calves and fat cattle will be safe among lions, and a little child shall lead them all. The cows will graze among bears. Cubs and calves will lie down together, and lions will eat grass like the cows. Babies will crawl safely among, among poisonous snakes, and a little child who puts his hand in a nest of deadly adders will pull it out unharmed. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for as the waters fill the sea, so shall the earth be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Our second reading is from Ephesians, chapter 6. Last of all, I want to remind you that your strength must come from the Lord's mighty power within you. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand safe against all strategies and tricks of Satan. For we are not fighting against people made of flesh and blood, but against persons without bodies the evil rulers of the unseen world, those mighty satanic beings and great evil princes of darkness who rule this world, and against huge numbers of wicked spirits in the spirit world. So use every piece of God's armor to resist the enemy whenever he attacks, and when it is all over, you will still be standing up. But to do this, you will need the strong belt of truth and the breastplate of God's approval. Wear shoes that are able to speed you on as you preach the good news of peace with God. In every battle you will need faith as your shield to stop the fiery arrows aimed at you by Satan. And you will need the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray all the time. Ask God for anything in line with the Holy Spirit's wishes. Plead with him, reminding him of your needs, and keep praying earnestly for all Christians everywhere. Pray for me too, and ask God to give me the right words as I boldly tell others about the Lord, and as I explain to them that his salvation is for the Gentiles too. I am in chains now for preaching this message from God, but pray that I will keep on speaking out boldly for him, even here in prison, as I should. 
This is the witness of the truth. Suppose, as a minister, as somebody who is called to proclaim God's word, the main question is, what can I do? I'm just one person. How on earth can I possibly make a difference when the world is so longing for that difference? And then I look out and I see all of you and I think, thanks be to God, we are not alone. We are many here, and we are many in the earth. The longing for peace is like a great cloud waiting to bring blessings on the earth. And it begins with each and every person saying within their own deep heart, what can I do? Now the theme of this Sunday is remembering. And I, uh, just while I was sitting there thinking about my boots, and my boots are very shiny, and I've been shining them now for almost 40 years when I bought my first pair. And I deliberately bought military boots because these boots became for me a symbol, a symbol of how I could get involved, how I could get engaged. I was just showing off there that I was doing that <laughs> What can I do? I can keep my balance. <laughs> Sorry about that. But I wanted to talk about my shoes because shining my shoes is in a very important part of my life. Every time I get out the polish, spit into the can, rub it on my boot, buff it up, shine it with the brush, and then give it that final last little luster with the rag, I am committing myself to the memory of all those who had such discipline. I remember my dad telling the story about a fellow in the army being asked, what was the most important thing when you were cleaning your Lee Enfield 303? And of course the fellows would come up with all kinds of answers. And finally the commander said, no, the most important thing is check the serial number. Make sure it's your gun that you're cleaning and not somebody else's. <laughs> I have so many memories of my life's experience that are connected to Remembrance Day. But I am not a sympathizer of turning those wars and all the wars into something nostalgic. I am somebody who wants to always hold in front of myself when I'm trying to determine how I should behave, the fact that war is hell. Now, Mr. Gatton could tell you some stories, other people could tell you stories, but it's not just hell for soldiers. It's hell for everybody. And Mr. Gatton and I were talking a little bit about the series on TV, MASH, and you've heard me mention it before. And how excellent the producers of that series were in terms of suggesting and sometimes openly stating that no matter what we may want to think about war, there's nothing glorious about it. But I do not want to take anything away from those persons who gave their lives. An example for me is a friend by the uh, name of Henry Callow. Henry Callow has passed on but Henry Callow was in the first war. And when I met Henry, he was an old fellow. I used to go to his home because his wife, Ivy, made excellent steak and kidney pie. And while we would eat that steak and kidney pie and maybe a little dessert after, old Henry would start to reminisce. And he would reminisce about his life's experience. He talked about the day that he was in Halifax when that powder ship blew up in the harbor, what a devastation it created, and what it felt like to be there. But the memory I'm thinking of in particular today is the memory of Henry Callow as a very young man hearing from his employer that war had been declared. And Henry said, the first thing I did was said, I'm sorry, but I have to quit my job. And he quit his job and he went to Winnipeg and he found a recruiting station and he enlisted to serve his country in that purpose. I don't agree with the purpose, 
but I admire and deeply respect the commitment of one young Canadian person who represents many thousands of young Canadian people, not only then but now as well, and not only soldiers but nurses and doctors and first responders and RCMP and police officers and fire officers, all those who are ready to give their lives to risk and to sacrifice, as we sang about earlier. Henry Callow thought it was important that he do something. And at the age of 90-something, he still had that memory of how important it was for him. And that's the reason I asked the question, what can I do? And I want to connect the question to an observation made by a very famous world citizen, Mr. Albert Einstein. And Einstein wondered at one point in time how it is that when war is declared, a whole country stops in its tracks, gives up its rights and its privileges, and chooses to take up the work of getting involved and making a difference. And Mr. Einstein could not get over the fact that it was so hard to mobilize people for the work of peace. And he suggested that just as it took resources, just as it took energy, just as it took spirit to go to war, it took spirit, resources, and energy to make peace. So I put to you the question, what can you do in our troubled time when there is so much going on that is so destructive of so many persons and so much of everything? How do we get involved? Now, I grew up in the 60s, and there was a rock band from Toronto called Steppenwolf. And Steppenwolf had a song, and the lyric sticks in my mind. And it's a song of apathy. Well, there's nothing you and I can do. You and I are only two. What's right and wrong is hard to say. Let's forget about it for today. We'll stick our heads into the sand, just pretend that all is grand and hope that everything turns out okay. Now, Mr. Steppenwolf, I can't remember his real name, was not suggesting that as a plan of action. He was being ironic. The exact opposite response is required. There is trouble in the world. There's trouble in my neighborhood. There's trouble in my home. There's trouble in my heart. What can I do? And if you ask that question of yourself, you may draw a blank. There's really nothing I can do. But if you turn from that realization that you are so very powerless in face of the great challenge, and in that moment if you lift up your eyes, lift up your heart and say, Oh God, won't you take me? Won't you make use of me in exactly the same way that the men and women who agreed to put on uniforms and carry guns and to launch missiles, in exactly that same way to take responsibility for the future of this planet in the hope that that future will be filled with peace for all people everywhere. Now, when we heard the text that Judy read from the prophet Isaiah, what we heard was poetry. When we heard the text from Ephesians, which some folks suggest the Apostle Paul wrote, what we hear is poetry. It's not literal. It's pointless to wait until a day that... Oh, did any of you notice three cougars somewhere in southeast Manitoba? It was in the news the other day somewhere. It's pointless to just wait for cougars not to eat lambs. That's always going to happen. That's the daily bread that God gives to cougars. But that animal nature in us, that spirit of competition for survival, that instinct to overcome what opposes us, can be overcome. There is no reason for human beings to act like wolves and sheep. Wolves who devour, sheep who are devoured. 
And believe me, folks, if you take time to study the history of the various wars in the world, they were almost always about economics. They were always about desperate times. And the only solution that the great persons, the leaders, could come up with was to go to war. Surely there's an other solution. I was listening to the radio not so very long ago, and there were persons from the Middle East speaking about our response in the West to their dilemma, their poverty, their lack of education, their lack of health care. And this person, a Muslim, wondered how it was that in the various earliest stages of these things, the Western developed nations didn't start sending medicine and food and clothing and doing everything that they could to make life a little bit better for these people instead of starting to call them enemy. People who despise us, therefore we are entitled to despise them. That attitude is what the text speaks about when referring to things like spiritual wickedness in high places, when the wolves use the sheep to satisfy their own appetites. What can I do? What can you do? I would encourage you to take the little passage from Ephesians home, maybe copy it out by hand or with your keyboard, print it, and put it someplace where you can see it by times. And say, am I wearing the belt of truth? Am I carrying the shield of righteousness? Am I wearing the helmet of salvation? Do my feet ready to go and spread good news? These are the weapons of our spiritual warfare. And I am encouraging you to enlist. Get engaged. Join the conflict against the darkness. Choose the side of light. Don't simply sit back. Now, I realize that I'm talking to a congregation that is well past the prime, although not at all past the age of wisdom. So perhaps there's not much you can do in a material sense, but if you spiritually get engaged with learning what it is that God expects of us and then grow in that spiritual reality, your influence with your children and with their children and with their children will be beneficial. But if you feel, and this is one of the hardest things for me to say as a preacher in the Western world, and Mr. Gadsby sitting here right in the front row, it makes me so sad to think of millions and millions of people, spectators at great sport events. If all those people, and I'm not saying they should give up that, but if they would invest just as much over here, Invest in getting engaged in making a difference for all of those things that are the roots and seeds of wars. So you see two persons in a quarrel and you come along and you decide to act as a mediator. A mediator. You get in between and you help them to sort it out. That's the work of peace. If you see somebody hungry, and you bring them food, that's the work of peace. If you see somebody without a home and you say, what can I do to help this person find a home? That's the work of peace. Because out of hunger, out of lack of housing, out of lack of education, grow resentment and envy. And these are the ground out of which conflict grows. And war is nothing but a big word for conflict. Friends, we are at a crossroads as a human species. We are either going to decide what really matters and separate it from what doesn't matter all that much at all. And the example I've used historically, it's fine for a grain farmer to play tennis. It's fine for a grain farmer to play golf or to play bridge or to watch movies. But if that farmer, in harvest time, 
is watching TV instead of thrashing out the grain, that farmer is going to face a very hard winter. Friends, let's honor those who went before us, who gave themselves, who gave themselves under such terrible circumstances. Let's give ourselves to make a difference before it's too late. Let's be makers of peace wherever we have opportunity. And please, hold me to that. If you see me being cranky and impatient and disparaging of others, remind me that I want to be an agent for peace and not for conflict. And I'll try to remind you as well. God being our helper, who knows, but what miracle might not arise in the history of the human race and Isaiah's dream of a peaceful planet for all people might come true. Let's see what we can do. Amen.